From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO with the Sumira Foundation for NMO and the Connor B. Judge Foundation. I'm Chelsea Judge. Today we're going to talk about a really unique and important topic on invisible symptoms with NMO, chiefly sexual dysfunction, as the title of this podcast suggests. Sexual dysfunction is a pernicious and all too common invisible symptom in NMO patients. But given the private nature of this symptom, it's not talked about nearly as much as it should be. I have the privilege today of sharing a conversation I had with Dr. Tamara Kaplan, and we cover all things related to sex and NMO. And thankfully, Dr. Kaplan provides some tools and resources and some key strategies for patients to take away to help improve this all too common symptom that can overall increase their quality of life. And now let's get to our conversation with Dr. Kaplan. Dr. Tamara Kaplan is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, and she's also an associate neurologist at Brigham Women's in Boston, Massachusetts. She predominantly sees MS and NMO patients, and we're really grateful to have her on our Demystifying NMO podcast today, where we're going to talk all things related to intimacy, so that sex, sexual dysfunction, and NMO. Dr. Kaplan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So let's just get right into it. We hear a lot about sexual dysfunction, intimacy issues in patients with with MS and NMO, but what what is it? What is sexual dysfunction? How do we define that? Yeah, so sexual dysfunction actually refers to any problem that prevents an individual from experiencing satisfaction from sexual activity. And there's a huge range of symptoms that this can include. Importantly, this involves men and women. So some symptoms include decreased libido, decreased sensation, a painful or heightened sensation, decreased vaginal lubrication, erectile dysfunction, and even ejaculatory dysfunction. Oh, wow. So there's quite a range. And I'm guessing that there's a lot of heterogeneity or like mix in what an MS or NMO patient would experience? Absolutely. And that has to do with a lot of their other symptoms of NMO itself. Okay. How common is sexual dysfunction? I guess in, probably harder to determine an NMO since it's so rare, but what, what are kind of uh, numbers are we looking at? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's such a good question. And the truth is we don't know, but we know that this is such a common problem. And it's one of the least talked about issues in NMO. And so it's really important to recognize and understand these symptoms because sexual and intimacy, sexuality and intimacy have a huge impact on the quality of life for nearly everyone. So while we don't have the exact data from NMO, we have some data from MS. Mm -hmm. And some studies suggest that 40 to 80 percent of women and 50 to 90 percent of men are affected. Oh, wow. So those are those are huge numbers, but also very wide ranges, which also just goes to show you that, you know, this hasn't been studied in in the way that it, it should. And people are often reluctant to even discuss these issues with their care team. Yeah, people would be embarrassed. Right, and they feel awkward and they feel alone, but it's important for all patients to know that they're certainly not alone and that these are very, very common issues. Yeah, I I think it's great for um, us to admit that here on the podcast, and that's the intent, is to talk about things that make people feel uncomfortable or that they normally don't want to discuss openly, that we can have this conversation that unfortunately is felt by a lot of people. Absolutely. So... And so this is a really pernicious, uh, common problem in the MS and NMO community. That being said, if it's it's high in MS and NMO, does that mean that NMO is directly contributing to sexual dysfunction? So that's a great question. And, and even the word contribute is, is an interesting term because the way I like to, to break down sexual dysfunction is in three categories. Mm-hmm. And for most patients, all three of these categories are are somehow involved. So first is primary sexual dysfunction. And that is where, you know, this is the result of damage to the central nervous system caused by NMO itself. 
So with animal damages neurons, this can result in disrupted motor and sensory pathways. And those motor and sensory pathways could be involved with your sexual organs. It could lead to numbness or in areas that, you know, are more sensitive. And so this can manifest with decreased sexual sensation, um, even decreased vaginal lubrication and erectile dysfunction, even sometimes just decreased libido. Wow. So you're saying that in some cases or to some degree, NMO, depending, I'm guessing, where a patient's lesion is, could potentially directly cause some form of sexual dysfunction. Absolutely. Wow. But then there's also a secondary, sex, sec, secondary sexual dysfunction mm-hmm. in NMO. And this is all the other symptoms of NMO that contribute to sexual function, like fatigue, bowel mm-hmm. bladder issues, weakness, spasticity. And so all these other symptoms of NMO can also result in decreased libido or even decreased willingness to engage in physical sexual activity. I see, because like if you're pathologically tired, you don't want to engage in intimacy. Or I could imagine if you're having bladder bowel issues, that doesn't make you feel, you know, quote, very sexy or in the mood. Right. And, and even certain things like spasticity could limit the positions that someone feels comfortable in. Or a painful spasm might interrupt sexual activity. And as you mentioned, those issues with bowel and bladder, sometimes that can create fear of an embarrassing accident during sexual activity. So this is another component of NMO where it's not the maybe like mechanism of disease itself that is causing sexual dysfunction, but because you have all of these symptoms, it's preventing or limiting your sexual activity. Exactly. I see. So that's, that's like pernicious. That seems like it's really hard to tweeze apart the different mechanisms and then how to approach it. Right. And as you know, oftentimes it, Sexual dysfunction might involve both primary and sex- secondary sexual problems. But then the third category that I like to talk about is tertiary sexual dysfunction. And this is all the emotional challenges and social pressures that people feel around sex. You know, per the media, we're all supposed to be young and beautiful and highly sexually active. <laughs> and, and some people with, with NMO might experience a loss of self-esteem or, or altered body image because their body doesn't work the way that it once did. And a lot of people have stress and anxiety associated with NMO and and associated with issues around sex. I could see how, you know, uh, maybe like grieving over having NMO, your loss of your former identity, or loss of like not matching up to a gender role or what the media says could really have effects on on your sexual identity too. Right. And, And I think one thing that it's important to keep in mind is that intimacy does not equal sexual intercourse. Intimacy can be defined as anything that makes one feel closer to another in a special or personal or private way. So feel that some people feel pressure that they should be you know, extraordinarily sexually active. And that's not, you know, that's not how everyone defines intimacy. Yeah, and I think you're, what you were getting at earlier, too, about the, what the media, what Hollywood paints is like, you know, a successful, happy person and their sexual appetite is so high, but that that's not real world. And anybody, including patients with NMO, maybe shouldn't try to meet those ridiculous expectations. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just anybody. And, and it's also important, we, you know, we can talk about this in a little bit, but stress and um, anxiety and depression are, are really common in everyone, but also in people with NMO. And, and when people are dealing with those issues, too, it can create a loss of sexual desire, and, and that can get in the way of, of your your ability to, to want to engage in sexual activity, too. Yeah, and Dr. Kaplan, I know we're going to talk about this a little later, but I imagine especially some of these tertiary, as you define them, or emotional challenges limiting intimacy would also maybe have an effect on the partner. They could feel the burden of the disease as well or, you know, obviously like feel for their patient or they might be experiencing some emotional challenges too that would affect intimacy. Absolutely. And one of the most common things that I, when I talk to my patients about these issues, the first question I ask is, have you talked to your partner about this? And you'd be surprised if so many people say, no, Mm -hmm. I didn't want to talk to to him or her about this. But but that's sort of the first person you should be talking about this. So, you know, you can both be on the same page about it. I can imagine that'd be a really difficult but very necessary conversation. 
And so I've mentioned, you know, this primary, secondary, and tertiary sexual dysfunction, but it's important to also realize in reality, most people are dealing with all three. Oh, and so they all compound on each other? Absolutely. And these are not mutually exclusive. And just because you have primary sexual dysfunction doesn't mean you don't get to have tertiary sexual mm-hmm. dysfunction. So all of these things can be addressed in different ways. And even though we're defining them as primary, secondary, and tertiary, I'd imagine that the degree of severity isn't highest just with primary versus tertiary. I'm sure like for a patient, it feels very much um, as strong if you, quote, only have tertiary sexual dysfunction versus primary or secondary. Yeah, I mean, they're all, it's, it's, it's so dependent on the person. I had a patient that I spoke to a few weeks ago, and she told me that she wasn't engaging in any sexual activity, and she felt that she was having a lot of, she used the term, sexual dysfunction. And finally, when we talked about it, she, she finally said, it's not my bladder, and I'm worried I'm going to have an accident mm. when I have sex. And so I said, okay, well, we can, there are so many things we can do to help address that. And getting over her fear of her bladder problems was, you know, a huge component of of why she wasn't able to engage in sexual activity. The first step is acceptance and being able to open up and talk about it to, to someone that you trust. Obviously, your partner, if you have one, and your clinician. Talking to your, your healthcare provider about this is so important, too. And, and oftentimes, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, I ask all my patients but, but not every healthcare provider does. I was just and, about to ask you that. <laughs> and so, and I, you know, oftentimes when I bring it up, I realize, you know, so many patients say, oh, well, I wasn't going to talk about this. Or they say, oh, I didn't realize this was related to NMO. Mm. And I said, well, it is. And we can talk about it. And there are so many things we can do to fix it. So please bring it up to your healthcare provider. (laughs) You know, you, Dr. Kaplan, you're on this podcast with us. You're talking about these issues. So clearly you're good about being proactive and talking about these sexual dysfunction issues with patients. Do you think that, like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing? Is it going to be on the patient to talk about it with their healthcare provider? Do you think that a lot of healthcare providers are more like you and being proactive about asking these kinds of questions or getting patients to open up? You know, I wish I could speak for all healthcare providers, but I can't. Um, but I think it's so important for all patients to be their own advocate. Agreed. Um, and, you know, you have to bring it up to your doctor and don't wait for them to bring it up to you. Uh, I like because that. Because they may not. And that you should feel comfortable and open and make and having these discussions because, like, as you said, there are tools, there are resources to address these symptoms. And maybe your doctor or your healthcare provider isn't the one that knows what to do because he or she isn't so familiar with these issues, but but maybe he or she can direct you to the right person who can help too. So that's important to keep in mind. Good point. So Dr. Kaplan, we highlighted all these different ways in which NMO contributes to sexual dysfunction, but I imagine that as you say, this is a common problem in general, that there are maybe like other causes or factors that are somewhat independent from NMO? Yes. And I think that's important to keep in mind too, because there's a lot of possible causes of sexual problems that have nothing to do with NMO, but can be related to normal aging, like vaginal dryness and decreased libido. Those could be results of menopause. And erectile dysfunction can be associated with certain medications, such as different antihypertensives. Uh, medications that control hypertension or vascular disease or diabetes, all of those things can contribute to sexual problems as well. Yeah, and that's another really good point. I know for at least a good amount, there's some association or like other autoimmune conditions that animal patients might have, or as you said, they uh, might be using other medications to help them treat their symptoms, like spasticity. What are the potential effects of comorbidities or uh, medications that animal patients might be using on sexual dysfunction? Yeah, so there's a huge effect that certain medications can have on on sexual function. So medications, for example, as you mentioned with spasticity, that medications that help with spasticity can also often make people extremely fatigued, mm-hmm. um, like medications like like baclofen or tizanidine. Those, those can make people feel really tired. And medications that help with neuropathic pain, like gabapentin, all these things can really decrease your libido. And when you're feeling really tired and you're just may not be in the mood 
And so it's important to talk to your healthcare provider about this and see if either dosages could be altered or if there's an alternative medication that can be, can be considered if you think that this could be playing a role. Oh, that, that, that's interesting. And obviously, patients want to be able to effectively treat their spasticity and pain symptoms. So, you know, you're not going to want to necessarily stop taking those medications because you want to address those symptoms, but maybe finding balance so that you're able to have a relatively healthy or balanced sex life. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really important. That's really important. So we've talked a lot about how NMO contributes to sexual dysfunction, various ways and effects of medications and other comorbidities, and you talked that there are um, tools or techniques to help overcome or help with these sexual dysfunctions. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah. So in, in terms of tools, as I mentioned before, I think the most important tool that we, we can all use is communication. Mm-hmm. And so communicating these issues with your clinician and also with your partner can be really helpful. And sometimes it takes a team. You know, there could be a urologist involved. There can be a nurse involved, a, psych- a psychologist or a psychiatrist involved as well. But there's some specific things, like for erectile dysfunction, there are some medications that can be very effective. Medications like sildenafil Sildel- um, or tadalafil medications that help with erectile dysfunction, generally those medications do work even in patients with NMO. For vaginal dryness, there's lubricate, lubrication agents, there's estrogen-containing vaginal preparations, there's topical creams, things like that. And and sometimes those, those things not only help with vaginal dryness, but can also help if there's pain mm-hmm. with, uh, with sex, um, because oftentimes that pain it, one of the contributing factors is, is dryness. I think the final thing that's really important, a really important tool is managing anxiety and depression because those can be huge contributing factors to sexual problems. And in terms of, you know, I, I should have mentioned this when we talked about medications, but there are certain antidepressants that can alter sexual function and even decrease libido. But again, this is another reason to bring this up with your clinician. Right. If you are dealing with depression or anxiety, there are certain medications that can be helpful without affecting your sexual function. I see. So for antidepressants, there's some with a specific mechanism that's associated, I guess, increased sexual dysfunction or decreased libido. And then at the same time, there's other antidepressants that work differently that are not. Exactly. And, you know, the overarching issue is um, depression can certainly affect sexual function. So... You know, if you're battling depression, you may not be in the mood Mm -hmm. to to be having sex. And so that needs to be addressed, too. And so, again, this is the importance of having a good relationship with a trusted clinician so you can openly talk about these issues and then find what works for you to, one, manage your primary and secondary and tertiary uh, issues related to sexual dysfunction from NMO and then make sure that those are also not impacting your overall quality of life. Absolutely. I think like it seems like your biggest takeaway for patients would be open communication about this issue. Yes, I, I, yeah, I think that's so important. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but sometimes even having that open communication with your partner, it, it's important just to talk about what your expectations are. Maybe we, as a patient, the patient might feel like, oh, my partner is expecting to have sex every <laughs> single night. But once they start talking t- together, they might say, oh, well, you know, I have a patient that said, you know, we found that our special time just watching a movie and holding hands was very intimate. And that was, you know, we, we sort of discussed how we define intimacy and it's yeah. different for us. And I think that that's one of the most important things about having these open discussions with your partner. I agree. And I think kind of going back to the beginning of our conversation, talking about not going with those media or societal expectations, but defining what intimacy, what sex means to you and your partner and and having that be as your model, not what, quote, everybody else is doing. Absolutely. Because this is such a personal, uh, a personal thing and it's different for every person and it's different for every couple. But, you know, it's important to talk about it. And, and the other reason to talk about it is that sexual dysfunction is, is probably the most invisible symptom of NMO. So many people are dealing with this, but nobody knows that, that you might be dealing with this. 
because it's such a private issue Mm -hmm. and it can have a huge impact on your quality of life. I completely agree. And that's why I'm so grateful that we have been able to have you here on the podcast, Dr. Kaplan, to talk about what is probably the most invisible symptom of NMO and definitely one that needs to be talked about more. So thank you so much. I'm happy to bring this issue to light because <laughs> we should all be talking about it. <laughs> Agreed. And I look forward to talking to you um, in our next couple of podcasts about a similar issue or maybe the next step in this conversation, which is talking about family planning and pregnancy and NMO. Yes. You know, I should finally just mention that I've heard of uh, one of my patients said she was nervous about engaging in sexual activity because she was afraid of getting pregnant. And she was oh, afraid no. of getting pregnant because she has NMO and oh. was worried about what that would what that would be. So we have a lot to talk about on that front, too. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that conversation. I, again, definitely very important. And hearing that kind of thing just breaks my heart that people have to even think that way or feel that they have to think that way. Yes. Yeah. So we need to talk about these things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Kaplan. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today about sexual dysfunction and NMO. I hope you're able to walk away from listening to this podcast with some ideas or strategies on how you can help either yourself um, improve sexual dysfunction or maybe your partner. Stay tuned um, in a few weeks for our next podcast topic, which will be on family planning and pregnancy and NMO. And then after that, in another few weeks, we're going to do a related podcast on parenting in NMO. And also, again, please let us know what you're interested in hearing. You can do that um, by sending us an email at chelsea at connorbjudgefoundation.org. You can also go to our websites, connorbjudgefoundation.org or sumirafoundation.org and let us know what you'd like to hear. How can we improve? Also, please, if you want to find us on iTunes or tune in, you can also give us a rating or review to let us know how we can do better. Thanks so much for listening.